I've been looking for a decent RPG series to play through from start to finish. Star Ocean is one title that many of you have wanted me to cover for a while now, so here it is, the start of my Star Ocean binge. I'll call it Star Ocean Sessions, where I'll be playing through and creating content for all the games in the series. So let's start with Star Ocean 1 First Departure R, released for the PS4 and Switch in 2019. This game is a remaster of the PSP version released in 2008, which is a remaster make of the Super NES version released in 1996, so yeah, Star Ocean 1 has had quite a few facelifts. So what is new in First Departure R? Not as much as I would have liked. We have new character art for the portraits, an option for Japanese voice acting and some changes to the difficulty, but for the most part, it is the same experience as First Departure on the PSP. Now, Star Ocean is a very long running RPG series, running for over 25 years, but the best part is, it is still going, with Star Ocean The Divine Force set for release later this year. I am looking forward to diving into this series once again, and particularly playing the later titles that I haven't played before. If you like this review, it would help me out a lot if you hit that like button and also subbed if you haven't already, because we have a lot of Star Ocean to cover in the future. Alright, let's get into it. Star Ocean begins in a village on the planet of Roak. One day, the main character Roddick and his friends set out to investigate a disease in a neighbouring village. This disease causes its citizens to get stoned, uh, turn into stone. While searching for a cure, they are confronted by Ronks and Ilya, who are from another planet. This is kind of a big deal, since the inhabitants of Roak are technologically primitive and have no knowledge of outside life. Roddick soon learns that this disease was brought to the planet by another race, so he tags along with the space travellers in hope of finding a cure. Basically, we have two main narratives, the journey of Rodak on a quest to solve the whole petrified human thing, then the larger intergalactic story which is much more sci-fi like and only really picks up its pace towards the end of the game. By today's standards, the story is simple yet fun with some entertaining moments. It's something that you can play without needing to think too hard. Something I really appreciated is that most of the game is fully voice acted and this does wonders for delivering these entertaining scenes as most of this acting is pretty good. Good. In fact, the whole presentation is right up my alley and I really miss the days of beautiful, detailed pre-rendered backgrounds. These still look great in high definition. What I don't miss about retro games, however, is not knowing what to do or where to go and Star Ocean is a huge culprit here. So much about this game is walkthrough dependent, with a lot of the journey requiring backtracking. This has to be one of the world leaders in forced backtracking and I really hate this. To make things worse, there is no real world map to tell you the names of all the cities, plus the random encounter rate is at a retrograde high. Fast travel also does not exist, but at least as a giant bunny to make world map travel faster and battle free, oh wait, good luck jumping through all the hoops to unlock this optional mechanic. Long story short, I don't like using guides in my RPGs, but it is highly recommended in Star Ocean. Even most of the 9 recruitable characters are optional and very easy to miss. This is great for replayability, as many are fairly interesting with their own backstories and side quests, but you're not going to know how to get them if you don't follow a guide. Take my boy Sears for instance, big cool strong guy with an oversized sword. If he asks to join your party, are you going to say no? No, no you're not. The problem is that if you do recruit him, and you probably will, this makes it impossible to recruit multiple other characters later in the game. I've played Star Ocean twice, and I've also fallen for this trap twice. If I ever play the game again, someone please remind me to use the guide and say no to the guy with the big sword. Also worth noting is that there are a load of different endings, which are largely based on the characters that you do recruit and the private conversations that you have with them in town. These private conversations raise the affinity between characters and viewing them are time and location specific which means they are easily missable <coughs> guide <coughs> I don't see them anywhere they should be around here maybe then again me tripping back there threw off our timing pretty badly there's a chance we're a good distance away from each other well we picked a good place to appear let's go look for them in this village first 
If there is one area that the first Star Ocean 4 short in, it is the spamtastic combat system. All you need to do to win most encounters is spam the same button over and over again. I do realise that this was originally a Super NES game, but this really doesn't make it any more enjoyable. So basically, you run around the place with your chosen character, hit a button for attack, or press the L and R triggers to unleash a special attack at the cost of MP. Only two special attacks can be equipped at once, which felt very limiting. I was hoping that these remasters would give us some more options here. If you have a mage character in your party, you'll be able to cast spells for area of effect damage. The problem is that the entire battle stops when most of these are cast, which completely ruins the flow of battle. This is great if you want to have a sip of beer, but there's only so much beer one individual can drink. Something that soon became very apparent is that character battle capabilities are almost entirely dependent on their equipment. Your weakest party member could instantly become OP if some great equipment is found for them. Ilya was my MVP for a long time after buying her armor which had way better stats than anything else available at the time. I am really not a fan of games where a character's strength is so equipment dependent. So, what do your AI party members do while you're busy spamming the attack button? There are a few AI options that can be selected. Physical attackers have no concept of MP management and will literally spam the same special attack over and over again until their MP runs dry. I got so sick of hearing Avenging Fist a million times that for my sanity was forced to turn Ilya's AI to no special moves. <laughs> The issues don't stop here though. Switching between characters in battle feels clunky and the button for targeting enemies doesn't seem to work or indicate who you're actually targeting. First Departure R also sees some tweaks to the difficulty. There are some odd difficulty spikes with the random mobs which can decimate you in an instant. For the majority of the game, the bosses are a complete cakewalk but the challenge clearly picks up towards the end of the game. This challenge was definitely not there in the PSP version so if you're a fan of other versions it may be worth giving First Departure R a run through. One of the most unique mechanics of Star Ocean is the skill system. When a character levels up, they will get a load of skill points to spend on a wide variety of skills. These skills have many different functions. First, you have combat related skills that are used passively in battle, such as power boost, which randomly increases attack power. Then there are the skills that are required for a character to learn a specialty. For instance, if Roddick learns the aesthetic, eye for detail, and mineralogy skills, he will learn the crafting specialty needed to craft equipment. Item creation is a huge part of Star Ocean and if you want to stand any chance at all against the strongest enemies you're going to have to dedicate some time into learning the ins and outs of this system. Doing so however will require a guide unless you're willing to spend 100 hours repetitively combining items through trial and error. One of the biggest issues here is that at times the success rates of combining seem so so low. There are things that you can do to increase your chances of item creation but still I desperately wanted some kind of percentage value to tell me what my chances were of successfully crafting something. Like I've said before, following a walkthrough is essential and will save you a lot of time and frustration. The original Star Ocean has had quite a few facelifts over the years, but at the end of the day, its core is still a game from 1996 and in places, it really shows. The story and characters were one of the shining lights. There's nothing revolutionary here, but it is charming and fun. The presentation of the game also really clicks with me with the detailed rendered backgrounds and the voice acting. The weaker points of the game include the basic combat system and the amount of backtracking you are forced to do. I will, however, give praise to this skill system for trying something different. While it is creative, unfortunately you are going to need a guide if you want to make the most out of it. This is something that applies to other elements of the game too. It is all so walkthrough dependent. Personally, I don't like this but I know some of you like following guides and that's fine too. Star Ocean is a decent enough game with some pretty cool ideas and First Departure R is a great way to experience this classic. What is your experience with the first Star Ocean and the series in general? Let me know in the comments. This was Hellfire RPGs, thanks for watching. It would help out a lot if you hit the like button and sub for more Star Ocean content coming soon. See you next time. <laughs>